Brian Gray, uh, he's a software uh, developer, and uh, he also spends his time uh, doing improv. And uh, you know, he, he has an interesting approach to you know what we're what we're trying to focus on today, which is creativity and staying inspired. So uh, you know, we found we found Brian and last minute, and he he he's coming through for us to to help us get get inspired to to learn and. Then, Stay creative and to have a good time. So, without further ado, Brian, welcome to podcast. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out at uh, nine in the morning. Seems like you're all pretty excited. Uh, I'm just waking up. Uh, but uh, and thank you to Norm for for having me. I'm super excited to do this. Um, I, I guess I just want to start with a, a quick little uh, story. So, as Norm said, I'm a a software engineer, and I think to give you a sense of how I work uh, creatively, just, just this week we were, um, uh, for those of you who do software stuff, it doesn't really matter if you do or not, but uh, at my job we're working with this uh, source control system called Git, it's like the uh, mother of all source control systems and that you can do anything you want but it's crazy powerful. And we're trying to figure out um, how to, we just did our first release, and we're trying to figure out how to uh, keep that code that's releasable so we can put uh, patches on that, whatever. And we have this meeting to figure out our workflow with Git. And they uh, we're doing all this whiteboarding and yada yada. And they're like, uh, I guess I volunteered or they picked me to say, can you take all this stuff and document, like set this up so that we can use this in the future? And I said, sure. So I sit and I look at all these whiteboard diagrams and all this stuff and I say, most of our wiki, the, where we document this stuff, is a bunch of just text everywhere and uh, source commands and all this junk. Um, and uh, so I started to think, like, I want to put some pictures together. And I look online, like, are there pictures of Git of what we're doing? And I couldn't find very much. This guy was the Git was written by the guy who wrote Linux, the Linux, a lot of the Linux kernel. Uh, not very picturey. So I started to put some stuff together in PowerPoint, which I don't know all of you personally, but I imagine you're like PowerPoint. That's gross. I don't know. Um, but I, <laughs> to me, it, it allowed me to make these animations um, where I could animate and say like, we're starting with this, we're moving towards this, we're moving towards that. And I started to make these pictures and people I work with were like, even after that meeting, I still didn't really get uh, what we were talking about, some of them, some of them did, they're smarter than me, uh, but a lot of them were starting to say, now I get what you're talking about. To me, that's like where my brain comes from is, is being able to take what I can do, come up with <coughs> solutions that um, other people you know, may not have thought of first to, to solve the problem that I really think is the problem. It's not like an understanding problem, it's in that case was a presentation problem. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I've been on stage since I was a young boy. Uh, that's me uh, at 12 as a dragoon guard in a, a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Um, and at some point, uh, this boy uh, grew up a bit. I went to CMU uh, because I wanted to, I've always also had an interest in computers. And I, I got this information systems degree. I got a minor in film, uh, but I also did a lot of non-student, uh, non-major theater there uh, with Scott and Soda, for those of you CMU alums. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of theater and I got a lot of exposure to different kind of arts. Uh, the other thing I did was to join the No Parking Players, which was an improv troupe on campus. We did these short games, we'd get a suggestion, we'd do some funny stuff for five minutes. Uh, and we also taught free workshops, so I got to take a lot of workshops and eventually teach workshops and get a little bit of exposure to teaching creative stuff, which is really hard. Um, eventually I graduated and I got a job with Summa uh, Consulting Company in Pittsburgh that also, I think, really values, so it, it's, a, it's a company about people and values the creativity of our people. We just hire some of the best people and we say, you do your smart stuff. And that really helped me to uh, engage continually in this uh, creative process. Uh, pretty soon after I started working, I said, you know, I want to be on stage more. It's just kind of my thing. I need to be performing. Uh, it's really hard to, um, oh, he's doing that. Uh, thought I was like, it's not my time and I'm up here. Weirdly. Uh, but it's, it's really hard. It takes a lot of commitment to be on a stage show. So I started this improv group with my friend Scott. And we performed for uh, years. We still perform now, actually. 
And uh, after a couple years, we started teaching as well. We did these free workshops. And the great thing about free workshops is that no one's paying you, so you feel like you can, uh, I, where's Norm? Am I allowed to swear? I'm not going to swear. <laughs> you, you feel like you can mess up a lot, uh, which, is, which is great. And I learned a lot about teaching just from failing all the time at it um, and just kind of making mistakes and people giving me feedback on that mistakes. Uh, a few years later, this is three years ago now, some, a couple from New York came to town and they started the Steel City Improv Theater in the north side, now in Shady Side. And I was on their house team for a while and eventually they said, Brian, we want you to come and teach for us, did some more teaching. Uh, and now I'm performing multiple times a week, uh, crazy, doing a lot more shows. And, and really the way you learn improv is by doing it a ton. Uh, recently this year, Arcade Comedy Theater, another theater, opened downtown. Uh, I'm now doing more shows, doing shows there, doing shows at the Steel City Improv Theater, we affectionately call it Skit. Um, up until this year, just more and more stuff. Uh, I started the show and I'm starting to get some press, some notoriety for what I'm doing, uh, the Bird Vivant magazine, which is new, if you don't know it, check it out, they're great. Uh, called this, this show that I did, Inspired. I really just wrote that quote because it relates to the theme of the event. Uh, and now the, uh, see, you guys like it. Uh, now the executive director of the Pittsburgh Comedy Festival coming in 2014, and I'm starting to do more and more uh, leadership and, and, and you know, executive yada yada around comedy. So that's a little bit about me and why I'm here, why I'm excited to talk to you about uh, merging my worlds of uh, technology and leadership around this creative process, uh, which I spend a lot of time on. So what, when I talk about improv, what am I talking about? Usually when I tell people I do improv who don't come from an improv background, they think about this. That picture doesn't look like much up here, but they picture a microphone on stage alone, a stool, maybe a brick background. That's stand-up comedy. Uh, I have a great deal of respect and admiration for stand-ups. I can't do it. I've never done it. I find it really hard. So that's people who get up on stage and they tell jokes. They tell jokes that they've rehearsed tirelessly, like over and over again. They go up to these tiny little clubs and they tell jokes and they see if they're funny. And if they're funny, uh, they do them again. And if they're not, they make them better. Uh, that's not what I do. Um, or they think of this. I also love this show. My uncle thinks it's the funniest thing on television. Uh, I think it's pretty funny too. Guys with weird costumes and I don't know, oh, Pittsburgh, it's a duck. Uh, and like, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. I, I didn't notice that until right now. Uh, and, um, and, and this is producers of this show who say, these guys do certain things really well. We're going to have them do that over and over again. That's also now what we do. So I figured the best way for me to show you what it is that I do when I talk about improv is to do a little bit of improv. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but a big part of what improv is to me is, um, is that I can't do it alone. So if I could get one person uh, who has never done improv comedy before, doesn't know what I'm talking about, uh, but is brave and uh, excited to try, uh, to raise your hand, you jumped up, uh, yeah, in the first row with Pascal. Come on up stage. Uh, what's your name? My name's Pam. Pam, another round of applause for Thank you. Hi, Pam. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. So good to meet you. Uh, so what we're going to do is just about five minutes. And actually, because I'm not going to check the time, uh, could you just dim the lights back on at about five minutes? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is what we're going to do. Um, all you need to do is just uh, uh, kind of uh, play along. Okay. okay? So we're going to start. Uh, just find a place you want to be on stage. And we're just going to start, all right? Okay. Uh, let me ask you a question before we start. Uh, what did you, what did, what, what were you doing yesterday? Uh, met a friend for lunch, was networking. Okay, I want you to be in the mindset of when you were having lunch with your friend. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you weren't waiting too long. I was here for a half an hour. Where have you been? You know where I was? Where? I was taking care of your son. Uh, you think that's son. funny, Pam? <laughs> well, then who was I taking care of? <laughs> there was a boy 
and there was a boy in your car, and you left him out there for an hour. What kind of car was that? What kind of car did you drive in? <laughs> I asked you first. You asked me first? Well, I was out there in a red Ferrari. <laughs> well, my car is red, but it's not a Ferrari. It's a, it's a, a Toyota Camry. So it wasn't, get... it wasn't my car, and I don't have a son. I know you're upset. No one should leave their kid in the car. But I it am, wasn't my son. I am upset, and frankly, frankly, I'm surprised you're not more upset than me. <laughs> you seem like, you seem like you walk in here for lunch. You know what? I'm, I'm sorry. You should have, you should have some bacon. <laughs> I'm sitting here yelling, and you didn't even get to eat yet. Well, uh, I ordered a salad. Thank you, though. Get you a son. Did you leave the kid in the car? <laughs> Did you? Yeah. You don't want to come back. When to come talk to you about it. All right. Well, I think we should go out and, and, and help that kid. Let's go. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the car. someone has to lose. Uh, so we kind of come to this agreement, someone's going to lose that duel, but we don't know who. We're collaborating in real time under um, some guys, some uh, things that we agree on ahead of time, but no one knows. We're building. It's a scene that no one knew where it was going. No one could have conceived of it beforehand. Um, it's not her idea, it's not my idea, it's our idea. We're working out together. She introduce the idea that it's this son that no one knows. She has a red car, it's not her car. And more importantly, that uh, she's older than me, which is true in real life, in improv, who knows what that needs to be. She's bringing this information, I'm bringing this information, um, and, and we're creating this thing together. Uh, to me, the best improvisation, it is collaborative. It is just like that. We're building it together. It is theatrical. Uh, hopefully, 
You know, some of the, the time we're goofing around, let's go out to the car. But hopefully, there's no car on stage, there's no restaurant there, there's no salad bar. But hopefully, I'm starting to create these things in your mind. We're starting to create these things in your mind. You can kind of see up here uh, those things that we're building together. Um, it's honest, you know, we're, we're it, it's goofy, it's funny, but we're starting to bring, it, it's always more entertaining when we bring these real emotions out rather than, uh, you know, in my mind, rather than sticky, uh, uh, you know, uh, I won't hate on who's line anymore. Uh, that's the point. And it's accessible, is that you guys have never seen comedy before, but you can laugh along with us here. You don't need a PhD in dramaturgy, uh, dramaturgy? Uh, to come up and, and see what we're doing. Uh, and it's funny. I would say last, but certainly not least, it's funny. Uh, that said, we do all this stuff. Uh, we're excited about the improv. And all of us, uh, I've been doing this 10 years, all of us, get into these, these times we uh, call slumps, ruts, whatever. This is, uh, read this just for one minute, from an um, improv resource center, it's a forum. Uh, okay, so we all get into slumps where we can't seem to make it, uh, make a right move, where we feel sluggish, where we throw out information and it doesn't hit, where even our attempts at supporting our scene partners seem to be hindering them. Uh, so this is, this is from an early improv student, and to me, uh, beginners, uh, even a year, three years, uh, five years into what they're doing, students all have similar experiences. And what I notice about this is that the kind of slumps that beginners have, or early students have, are different than the kind of slumps that I have. So what this student is talking about, he, her, he, ladies, whatever, uh, is, is that, uh, is common to what I hear, is that, you know, I don't know, I can't think of anything on stage. I don't know what to say. Uh, I've learned so much that it's all piling up in my mind and I just have nothing to say. Uh, and to me, that's different from the slumps that I get into. To me, my slumps are that I can't push, I get comfortable. I can't push myself out of my comfort zone. I, I have been doing this so long that it's just routine. I could wake up in the morning, walk out at 9 o'clock and do an improv show like this and that's nothing to me. Um, so how do I get myself out of my slumps? There's a really great quote that goes around the improv world by someone who's been doing this over 20 years, named Susan Messing, teaches out of the Annoyance Theater in Chicago, um, who says, if you're not having fun, you're the asshole. <laughs> I forgot I asked before if I could swear, so I'm swearing now. But, um, uh, and it, to me, this is not at all a negative quote. And this actually comes from a site called Improv Art Vice. It's a guy who draws uh, quotes of improv people. So this is not me to do this, but um, this is kind of how quintessential this quote is. And the way I took it, when I heard it, this hit me like a, a, like a bullet. Um, and is that an expression? Uh, but it, it hit me. And the, the reason is that it, it took her 20 years to figure this out. Is that she's, she's not saying you're an asshole. What she's saying is that all you control on stage is yourself. There are so many people that spend so much time saying, that scene wasn't good because this guy is being a jerk. Because everything I'm giving him, everything I'm giving her, she's denying me. She's doing all these bad improv moves. She's just not fun to play with. It's her fault, it's her fault, it's my fault. I mean, it's, it's his fault. And the truth is, if you're not having fun, you are the asshole. It is your job, you control yourself, and, and you are the only one that can ensure that you are having fun in that scene. And we talk about fun for your job, for whatever you do. Fun might not be the metric that you measure, but for us, if a scene is enjoyable, it's because you're having fun in it. And we do all this stuff in classes and whatever to make sure that you're having fun, but to me, that's the metric, is are you able to enjoy yourself in that scene? And, and she's not saying it's easy. This is really hard. To be able to go to a jam, to be able to play with someone you've never played with before and have a good time is really hard. This is, our, this is basically became my life's work is to be able to, in any scene I'm in, in any environment I'm in, to be able to have my own fun, to be able to make my own fun in that scene. Um, and that became very inspired. So to be able to keep that inspiration up, there's a lot of different things that I do. Um, one way, if I'm in a rut, if I'm in a, a, a hole, is I soak up a lot of inspiration. This is uh, that team I talked about, Irony City. Uh, early on, we, there wasn't a lot of improv in Pittsburgh, so we had a couple thousand dollars, actually, from doing shows. And we took a trip out to Chicago. Uh, we spent a weekend just seeing a ton of shows. We took a workshop guide Second City uh, called Jason Schatz. Uh, and we just hung out. We bonded for a while. Um, we studied with new teachers. I do a, a duo show. Uh, sorry, I 
turn this back on. I know, I'm kind of loud, but. Um, I do a show with a friend of mine named Greg. There it is. Uh, and we had been doing the show for three years, and it got to the point when I first did it, him and I on stage, it was like nothing else I had done before. We really pushed each other. And after three years, we were just like, it was old hat to us. We could, you know, it was kind of boring. It was a boring show. We started studying with this guy, Sam Turek, who teaches here at Point Park. Um, and he really, sh he got us to the point that we were literally uncomfortable on stage with each other. We were doing things we had never done before, and that was really incredible for us. Um, for us, it's joining and starting a new group. You know, again, for you guys, I'm not sure what how this translates exactly, but maybe it's a new project, whatever. Uh, but there was a time where I was doing a forum that I'd done, again, for years and years, and the ability to go and start, uh, I started this group called Imposters, which is a bunch of people, and I said, I want to do this forum in a whole new way, in a way that makes me feel proud to be doing that forum. Uh, we got a lot of good response from our, our shows with Imposters that ran for a couple of years. Um, or to find a new project, uh, I had a photo of this, but uh, the, the project I was showing you, uh, the End of the World show, uh, was something where we had, uh, a smartphone app, we had the audience dressing up, we had all kinds of crazy stuff going on, um, got a lot of good reviews as well. Oh, that's the photo. Uh, and uh, teaching for me is also really inspirational. Finding way, to me, teaching this kind of creative work is incredibly challenging and really makes me understand how I understand it. Um, and my students continue to inspire me as well. And finally, last but not least, uh, or I, as a last resort, I would say is uh, sometimes I've, I've taken a break. Um, and reading a book, taking on a new hobby, um, you know, getting involved in social media for me is scary. Uh, and uh, kind of just getting away from improv for a while has helped as well. Um, how's my time? This is, oh, Norm's gone. Anyway, uh, I'm going to dive into it because it's interesting to me. This is my last little bit, and it's kind of unrelated to what I was talking about. But uh, I, have, I have been blogging, I have this podcast, and the one thing that I've learned uh, from doing it is that what's really fascinating to me, I listen to a lot of podcasts, I listen to, I, and I read a lot of blogs, and uh, the podcast that I started is called Talking Shop, an improv podcast, and it's really geeky. Um, it's, it's for improvisers, and I sit and I talk to people about how they do the work that they do, and everyone universally uh, says, that's a really great podcast, but it's, no one's ever going to listen to it. Uh, and I've learned that the problem with my podcast is basically the... Um, the form of the podcast itself is what I care about about my podcast. So this is less about me saying anything interesting about me, and we're kind of opening this up to uh, to you guys. Maybe it's something you're interested in discussing, or you're just interested in talking to me about. And that's that um, the difference between kind of a podcast that's entertaining and a podcast that's aimed at uh, showing people anything. Um, so let me let me give you an example. So here's a an improv podcast. Um, that Matt Besser puts out from the UCB. Uh, this is just a quick minute of it. Um, and this is what I would call uh, an entertaining podcast. And it's gone. Okay, it's you people who are responsible for the suppression of homosexuality. You people are responsible for proposition hate. You people are responsible for Doma. You people are responsible for everything. Guys, for everything he's saying is true. People. As loud as he is. Ayn <laughs> <laughs> Rand was an atheist. Excuse me, churchgoers. Hey, churchgoers. Whoa, 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 whoa. you're church. stepping on my foot. Everyone in this church, you listen to me. Hey, you weren't invited in here. Yes, the Fred did say, well, we welcome all people. And Fred is so I decided to come in because it's you people. It's yes. you people. Hey, bring it down a notch. How are you sweating in the middle of winter? It's freezing cold outside. I walked over here from my apartment because I don't have a car. I walked over, I walk everywhere. And yes, I was carrying my laundry to the laundromat. And I had to put it down, and it was very heavy because I haven't done it in three weeks. And you listen to me, you this queer is our killer. Easter. This yeah. is our Easter service, sir. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Easter. Oh, so you bow before a little bunny rabbit, and you shove chocolate in the faces no. of your children, no. and you tell me that obesity isn't your fault? <laughs> 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 about how you are happy to call people out through your improv. 
asking uh, Jack Walsh, I noticed before. Um, is this something, so kind of like you were just saying, like, I'll, I'll wait for that scene to, to be about, you know, about us again. Uh, is that something you do intentionally, or is that like you just your personality coming out, I, like a choice you make? Uh, I, I guess it is intentionally because you know I always wanted to try to be about us. So if it starts being not about us, then I'll I'll make it about us. So yeah. So that's the idea. Is Matt Besser has this podcast that's great where they get tweets from people as suggestions. They uh, listen to YouTube videos and they have a bunch of really talented people improvise on the air. Uh, I have a podcast where I talk to really smart people about their process. Uh, my theme song says it's not about the past or the future, uh, let's talk shop. I don't really talk to them about their history, how they came into improv, I just talk to them about how they do their work right now. Because um, that's what's fascinating to me, and I listen to podcasts like that, and my goal is to really learn how to be a better improviser, and people say, no one's ever gonna listen to your podcast. Um, to me, these kind of podcasts appeal to a wide audience. Um, mine have kind of these high and mighty goals for a really niche audience. Um, these use the internet like you would have never heard that, and, and probably me in Pittsburgh, even though I like improv, would have never heard that if it wasn't for the internet. Mine use the internet uh, to expand its reach, its reach to this really tiny niche audience, which is still going to be small. Uh, these can make money, you know, they have sponsors and all that jazz. Um, mine likely won't. Um, and even when you think about like This American Life and these kind of podcasts, like I would consider those entertainment podcasts where they they their hook is always like people will sit, you know, Jane sat in the car for an extra 20 minutes when she got home finishing This American Life. Uh, that's because it, it's entertaining. Um, and there's some examples. So, you know, I think a lot of my story or my questions are, and even my blog is a lot the same way, is, um, you know, uh, around, it doesn't matter. So people come and talk to me and they say, you know, why don't you talk a little bit more to your guests about, like, people want to hear the story of these people, how they got into improv, that's really, you know, I want to relate to that. And I just want to say, you know, to me it's like, how do you work? How can I be, how can I be an improviser like you? And uh, more just an open question. Uh, so I'm done. Uh, I just want to leave you with, I guess, a couple of thoughts, which is, uh, so my blog is called Care About Something. Um, that was the title of this talk. And I think that when I think about uh, inspiration, it's the scenes that I want to see on stage are scenes who, between people who care about each other. Even if they hate each other, they care about each other. So I think in your work, in your own day-to-day -day life, if you care about something, if you're passionate, people are going to care about um, listening to you. Uh, if you, if you do identify that you're in that slump and you need inspiration, you know, find it, change something, um, and if you're not having fun, you're the asshole. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me.